passage is Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. If you'd like to turn there, if you have a Bible, we're in Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. And in this passage, Luke describes a funeral like no other. Uh, in a sense, Jesus ruined this funeral in the most beautiful of ways. And so listen as I read from Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, he, Jesus, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is God's word. You know, this passage, as you might imagine, got me uh, to thinking about funerals and about death. And it's my observation that, generally speaking, the older a person gets, uh, the more you think about death and think about funerals. When I graduated from high school, I think I had gone to one, maybe two funerals in my life, and I, I pretty much never thought about death. Just didn't cross my mind. Why would I think about that? Old people die. Uh, but now, at my stage of life, and at my age, like some of you, uh, I've gone to dozens and dozens and dozens of funerals, and I think about death quite a bit. And one reason for me is because I officiate a good number of funerals. And uh, I have the privilege, and it really is a privilege, I have the privilege of walking with families that are grieving the loss of a loved one. I mean, you just walk with families. And you, you have this privilege of, of talking about the type of service that they want, the type of service that would honor the person who has passed away, uh, the type of service that would honor God, type of service that would, would really allow those who gather to grieve well. And typically, in every, every funeral I've done, somebody talks about the person who has died. Sometimes it will be one or two people. Sometimes there will be an open mic. And anybody who wants can share their memories, share their stories. And so typically you'll hear touching stories, you'll hear humorous stories, and sometimes you'll hear inappropriate stories. <laughs> They're also humorous at times. And I'm not embarrassed to admit that when I hear people talk about others at funerals, the question crosses my mind. I wonder what they're going to say about me, right? Do you wonder that? And that's, that's a valid question because unless the world as we know it ends, before we die, all of us here today will have a funeral, and somebody will get up and say something about us. And so we wonder, what will they say about me? And so that's a, that's a significant question because your reputation matters. It matters a lot. But infinitely more important is the question, when I die, what will God say about me? Or if God could come and speak at my funeral, what would God say about me, right? I mean, on that day, does it really matter what other people think? Uh, what, what is God going to think of us on that day? And that may sound like an unanswerable question, right? But, it, but it's actually not. Because in the New Testament, if you want to know what God thinks, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God says, listen to what Jesus says. If you want to know how God feels, notice the emotions of Jesus. If you want to know the types of things that God does, Watch what Jesus does. And so today we're going to look at this, this passage in, in Luke 7. 
And we're going to notice what Jesus thinks and says and feels and does when he encounters a grieving widow. Luke's account in Luke 7, 11 through 17 helps us understand Jesus' attitude toward death and funerals. I don't know if that's what you expected to hear about, think about today, but that's what we're going to talk about. In verse 11, we read that soon after Jesus had healed the centurion's son, or the servant in uh, the previous passage in Capernaum. He travels to another town about 20 miles away, and we read this. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. So here's Jesus, his disciples, and a great crowd. And what we learn in verse 12, that as he approached the city, he was met by another crowd, a funeral procession. As he drew near to the gate of the town, Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. The details that Luke gives are significant. Luke tells us in chapter 1 that when he wrote this account, this this gospel as we called it, he set out to, to write an ordered account to explain and give certainty about the things that had already been written. And so what we learn here, the details are significant. First of all, this man who had died is described as the only son of his mother. And there's a very common Greek word for only, but this is the rare Greek word. It's used only only three times in the Gospel of Luke. And each time it's used, it's used of a son or a daughter who had either died or was in danger of dying. So here we have the only son of a widow who died. In the next chapter, uh, we're going to have Jairus' daughter who had died, his only daughter. She had died and is brought back to life. In chapter 9, a man had an only son who was tormented by this evil spirit, and he cries out to Jesus to deliver him. He, uh, he said he... he uh, throws him into convulsions and slams him to the ground. And so just file away in your mind this habit. Jesus had this habit of either bringing back to life or delivering only sons and daughters who were in desperate conditions, died or on the verge of dying. Luke also tells us that this son's mother was a widow. Both the Old and the New Testament stress the importance of caring for widows and their distress. And surely that's what Jesus was doing in this passage. And uh, many would, would say that one of the deepest, if not the deepest types of grief that a person can experience is the death of a child. So she had, exp- she had experienced that type of grief and anguish as some of you have. And as well, she probably would now face a very uncertain future, financially, socially, because her husband had died, and now her only son had died. He was likely have provided the primary income. And we're told Jesus' response beginning in verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, do not weep. And so Jesus had compassion on this woman. His heart went out to her. Uh, Generally speaking, it's not a good idea to tell grieving people at a funeral, do not weep. That happened to me. In 1990, my dad died, and we were at the graveside service, and I was walking away, and I was crying. And and a well-intentioned friend came up to me, Steve, don't cry. It's going to be okay. It's not helpful. It is not, not helpful to tell a grieving person, just stuff your emotions down. Don't let it out. Uh... No, gr- grief, is, grief is good. Tears are a gift from God. But that's not what Jesus was doing. He wasn't telling this woman to suppress her emotions. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself wept at his friend Lazarus' grave. By saying, do not weep, Jesus was actually subtly telling her, actually, the reason you're weeping will soon be gone. And so unlike other miracles where Jesus healed in response to a request or he healed because someone exercised great faith, uh, here Jesus just took the initiative. His compassion moved him. He unilaterally 
decided to act. So in verse 14, then he came up and touched the bier. That was basically a stretcher on which they carried the body. And they didn't have to touch it. Probably shouldn't have touched it. We're told that <clears throat> touching a dead body in the, in the law, it made you defiled. Um, but apparently that didn't apply to Jesus. When Jesus touched something unclean, it did not, it did not affect him. No, Jesus affected what he touched, who he touched. He, he made them whole. And so he touched the bear. The bear stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. Just as Jesus spoke a word and healed the centurion servant from a distance, just like he spoke a word, cast out demons, he spoke to the dead man. Young man, I say to you, arise. No incantations, no fanfare, simply a command. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. And we, we wonder what he said, right? What did he say? But that's not the point, what he said. Uh, the point is that he said things. Dead people don't sit up and speak. This young man had come back to life. And the comment that Jesus gave him to his mother reminds us that Jesus was addressing his, this, this widow's grief by giving the son to the mother. He was, he was saying, you no longer have this reason to weep. And notice the response of the two crowds. Remember these two crowds had come together along with the disciples and they had witnessed Jesus raising this man from the dead. Verse 16, fear seized them all. It's appropriate to fear when you're in the presence of someone that powerful. You can imagine what it would be like if he can speak and raise somebody from the dead. What else can he do? Is it even safe being around this man? And so fear seized them all. And they glorified God. They praised God. They, they, they acknowledged God. And they did that by saying two things. First of all, they said, a great prophet has arisen among us. And secondly, that God has visited his people. And so they made these two, two statements. And they were actually both true. But they were, speaking, uh, they were speaking things that were much truer than they realized. First of all, they said, a great prophet has arisen among us. And that was true. Prophets uh, spoke for God. They were God's representatives. Prophets often did, or, or occasionally, didn't often do, but occasionally did miracles. It's very likely that they were thinking of the prophet Elijah. And some of you, if you, you've read 1 Kings 17, you know why. Because this miracle is strikingly similar to a miracle that Elijah did. It's in 1 Kings 17. Uh, Jesus actually mentioned the miracle when he was in his hometown synagogue. It's, it's recorded in Luke 4, the widow at Zarephath. There were all these widows in Israel, but God sent Elijah to this widow, this Gentile widow. And what he did, she had this only, she had this only son, and he died. And Elijah, he had this relationship, this, this, he had helped this, this widow before. And so Elijah took this boy, he carried him up to his room, he laid him on his bed, and he stretched himself out on top of the body three times, and he cried out to God, cried out to God, bring this boy back to life. And after three times, he did. And we're told that Elijah took this only son of a widow, and it says that he presented her, he, no, it says he delivered him to his mother. And so there's all these striking parallels. There's a striking difference, however, because whereas Elijah, with great effort and great energy, had to appeal to God, Jesus did not have to do that. Jesus spoke, and the only son of the widow was brought back to life. And so like Elijah, Jesus was definitely a prophet, but he was actually the prophet that God had promised to Moses. He said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you, and everything he speaks is going to be my word. And actually, people's eternal destiny, whether they live or die, is going to depend on whether they listen to his words. And so Jesus is that prophet. 
The other thing they said is that God has visited his people. And it was true, whenever a prophet arrived or an angel appeared, God was visiting his people. Uh, and so it was true that God had, had visited them. But Jesus wasn't merely a human who represented God. He was actually God in the flesh. And in the Gospel of Luke, when God visited his people, God's visitation, it wasn't just God stopping by to say hello. It was God decisively entering human history to redeem his people. When you get over to Luke chapter 19, when Jesus comes into, into Jerusalem, he weeps over the people because they did not understand the time of his visitation. God showed up in the flesh and they didn't recognize him. They, by and large, did not want him. They crucified him. And so, even though they had this limited understanding of who Jesus was, the people had spoken the truth. Jesus was a prophet, and God had visited his people. Not surprisingly, therefore, we read in verse 17, and this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Jesus' reputation grew and swelled in and around Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus would soon resolutely set his face to go and die for the sins of the people. And so that's the account. And now we ask the question, what does this passage teach about Jesus' attitude toward death and funerals? Well, very, very simply, it tells us that Jesus has both the compassion and the power to raise the dead. Okay, you leave this viewer there, there will be no doubt in your mind. Jesus has both the compassion and the power to raise people from the dead. He didn't have to raise this woman's only son, but he had compassion, so he did. It's not enough just to have compassion. A lot of people have compassion. He also had power. He could speak, and it happened. Now we ask the question, why does this account why does it matter to us? Well, one reason it matters is how this account fits into the larger plot of the Gospel of Luke and really all of the Bible. The basic plot of the Gospel of Luke, and you might have noted, you might have thought this thought may have occurred to you. The basic plot is that Jesus, God's only Son, died on a cross to pay for our sin. And then God, by his power, raised him from the dead. Okay? And so it turns out that both the son's death and resurrection are expressions of God's compassion and power. And the most famous expression of this truth is found in John 3.16. We read, for God so loved the world, had such deep compassion for the world, not just the Jewish people, for, but for the whole world not just one small tribe, but for every grouping of people, like this grouping over here and this grouping over here, people in Kansas, all ethnicities. God, had, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that's the word, it's the same word. The King James Version famously translated his only begotten son. It's not the best translation because it, it really, a better translation is his one and only son or his unique son. It's also used of Isaac, Abraham's son Isaac. He wasn't his only begotten. Abraham had other sons, but he was his unique son. The, the, the covenant would come through Isaac. And so God so loved the world that he gave his unique son. And Jesus often referred to himself as the son of God. The father took the initiative. He didn't have to, but his compassion compelled him to send his unique son. And then Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay for our sins. And then by his great power, God raised his only son from the dead on the third day. And God did this so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The reason we would perish if we don't believe in Jesus, is because we all sin. It is the condition of humanity. Every one of us, we sin by nature and we sin by choice. We sin in, in, uh, in ways that we realize, in ways that we don't. And because of our sin, we are spiritually dead. 
We need to be raised spiritually from the dead. We're living in the, in the domain of darkness. We are dead in our sin. We need to be made alive. And there is not a single thing we can do about our sin. We can't pay it off. We can't work it off. We can't bargain with God. The only way to have our sin removed is to have it forgiven as a gift by the one whom we have sinned against. And so that's exactly what God does for whoever believes in him, in Jesus. And so consequently, we don't perish. You believe in Jesus, you accept his payment for your sin, you don't perish, you don't experience eternal death, but you have eternal life. You have it here and now, and it just keeps getting better and better and better for all eternity. And so it turns out that God has both the compassion and the power to raise you from the dead. That's what this passage foreshadows. That's what this passage prefigures. He raises you from the dead spiritually when you believe, and he will raise you from the dead bodily when Christ returns. And so, believing in Jesus and having eternal life, it will forever change the way you think about your death and your funeral. And so when you think about your death, you have this assurance, you have this confidence. And so when you die, your body quits working, okay? We have mortal bodies. They are weak, they are prone to sickness and disease, they eventually die. And when our bodies die, uh, our spirit, if you believe in Jesus, your spirit goes directly into the presence of the Lord. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 1, for me, to live is Christ my entire life. As long as I live, it's about honoring Christ, walking with Christ. But to die is gain because the instant I die, I will go directly into the presence of Jesus Christ. And so if you believe in Jesus, it will forever change the way that you think about your death. And so death marks the transition from life on earth to life in heaven with God. And when it comes to your funeral, those who attend your funeral, they will still grieve because death is an enemy. Death separates us from people that we love. Uh, but the people, if the people at your funeral are clued into the things that we're talking about here today, uh, they will not grieve like other people. Uh, they will know that you are home, your pain, your suffering is over, and you are eternally home with your heavenly Father. They'll grieve in light of God's great compassion for you. He poured out his compassion on you. And they'll grieve in light of God's great power to bring you home into his very presence. And people will tell stories, right? They'll tell touching stories. Uh, they will tell humorous stories, knowing some of you. They will tell inappropriate stories that are probably funny. But all those, all those stories pale in comparison to the story they will tell about your life. They will say, our beloved friend, brother, sister, mother, father, son, daughter, they knew Jesus Christ. And they are directly in the presence of God himself and Jesus and his spirit. And so we grieve, but we do not grieve like those who have no hope. It's an absolutely different thing if you believe in Jesus Christ. And if God showed up and he stood up to share, he would say, I have welcomed my son, my daughter, into my very presence. What a moment. What a moment that was. And when they go to your graveside service, usually people will gather at your grave and they will commit your body to the ground. We're made from dust, we return to dust. And someone will probably read a passage of scripture. They may read 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 15, Romans 8, 1 Thessalonians 4. They will remind people that uh, even though your remains turn to dust, there will be a day when Jesus returns 
and you will be transformed in an instant. You will be raised bodily from the dead. You will have a body that's akin to the resurrection body that Jesus has. And they may read Philippians 3, 20 and 21, which says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. That's what God does. He raises from the dead sons and daughters, his beloved sons and daughters. God has both the compassion and the power to raise you from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and this will be your experience. This will be your experience. Father, we ask that you would burn these truths on our hearts. God, may we not be like those that missed the point when Jesus visited your people. May we understand the significance that he came to redeem us. He came to buy us back. God, we celebrate your great compassion. You didn't have to send your unique son for us, but you did. We celebrate your power. Only you can raise the dead. And so we celebrate that now in Jesus' name. Amen.